Welcome to Navigating Cancer Together. My name is Talaya Dindi. I'm a cancer thriver, cancer doula, independent patient advocate, and owner of On the Other Side. I use my experience to help others get on the other side of cancer. Gaps between the guidance, emotional support, and education that are needed and what one receives can be huge. This podcast fills those gaps by sharing stories, resources, and information about all things related to cancer and wellness. I interview guests from all walks of life who are living with cancer, caregivers, and those who are thriving on the other side. Also, I talk with organizations, healthcare professionals, and experts in the health and wellness spaces who offer complementary and integrative care. Join me. We are in this together. Hello, everyone. This is Talaya Dindi from On the Other Side That Life, and you're listening to Navigating Cancer Together, the show that has something for everyone facing cancer. Why? Because everyone is different with different needs, beliefs, and perspectives. Thank you for joining us for this episode. I encourage you to open your minds and your hearts. Today, our very special guest is Mr. Stephen Washington. Stephen is a movement master. That's new. I'm excited to learn more. A certified Qigong instructor, author, and recovery advocate who is passionate about helping others navigate toward a happy, healthier life. His lifelong love and a key foundation to his spiritual fitness is movement, and he firmly believes our relationship with our body is vital for emotional, physical, and spiritual growth. His online members community, SWE Studio, offers 300 plus mindful movement video classes and wellness resources for the mind, body, and soul. Stephen's journey to sobriety inspired his first book, Recovering You, Soul Care and Mindful Movement for Overcoming Addiction, which combines self-care with Chukong movements. Since making the conscious decision to get sober 20 years ago, he has impacted countless lives through movement and his keen ability to connect and relate to others. Such important work, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. Thank you, Talia. It's lovely to be here with you, spend some time with you. This is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to have you. Movement master. Mm -hmm. I just want to learn more about that. I've never heard that term before. I know that you work with a lot of different modalities. So please tell us more about that, Stephen. Movement has been a key part of my life since the day I was born. I feel as though I stepped out of my mother's womb dancing and moving and dance was my first love. I used to dance around the living room and eventually I found my way into dance studios. But movement, I'm very keenly aware of the language of the body. And whether it's dance or Pilates or Qigong or any other type of physical activity, I have so much experience and knowledge of my years of training and my own personal experience around movement and then also guiding people over the years in various types of movement. I know the power of it. And that movement is a very healing practice for each and every one of us. And no matter where we are on our health journey, movement is always accessible to us, even if it's simply the movement of the breath. Because even if we're standing perfectly still, there's still movement happening within the body. So that's been my mission in life to share my mastery of movement with other people to help them, to really help themselves. Wonderful. That's one thing that I heard a lot about in the healthcare community is that movement is key. So I really understand the importance of that work. And it's something that we all can do. We're all supposed to do. Our bodies are meant to be in movement, not just sitting stationary all day. So that's very important. Please tell us for the people who don't know, what is Qigong? Qigong, very well, very good pronunciation. I got it that time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's challenging for, for most of us in the West. <laughs> Qigong is a, it's a movement practice that combines flowing movement, standing postures, deep breathing, 
self-massage and focused intention to activate, cultivate, and circulate life force energy. Uh, when you take the word qigong and you break it down in half, qi means energy and breath, and gong means work or skill. So the practice of qigong is a practice of becoming more skillful at managing our energy. And there are different forms of energy. I, I think the most dense form of energy is just our physical body. Our physical bodies are a dense form of energy, but there are also subtler forms of energy within us. There's our emotional energy. We can't touch an emotion, right? We can't see it in the air, but yet it's still tangible. It's something, it's just a more rarefied energy. And then there's also our thoughts and our consciousness is another, a higher level of energy. According to traditional Chinese medicine, it's all the same energy, just in different stages of manifestation, like ice melting into water, evaporating into mist, right? It's all water and different forms of it. One of the beautiful things about Qigong is that it reinforces our connection to nature, to the universe. We're all made of the same stuff. We're all made of the same stuff, whether it's the stars What's in the stars is also within each and every one of us. What's in the water, what's in the ocean, it's a part of us. We are mostly made up of water. The beautiful aspect of Qigong is that it brings us in harmony with nature. I think because of the fast pace of the world and of innovation and the fast pace of growth and development that the human species has done and engaged in, we've moved further and further away from nature and source and qigong is a practice of us to come back to nature source the earth the heavens the stars the water fire wood all the different elements to bring us in harmony and to bring us in balance because that's really how we're supposed to live because we're all interconnected Stephen, how can qigong help people with cancer or recovering from cancer that's a great question. Qigong is a practice that helps us, like I said, become more skillful at managing our own energy. And one of the things that we all experience in life is stress. And stress has a tremendous impact on the body. And of course, I think anyone who receives a cancer diagnosis is suddenly thrust into an incredibly stressful situation. Um, and then just the process of getting the care that one needs and moving through that process of healing, it takes a tremendous toll on the physical body, on our emotions, on our, on our minds. So Qigong is a practice that could help us to manage the stress that's involved that we all experience. And it's not even just a benefit to the person who is suffering from cancer, but also those loved ones around them who, who are caring for them. I think it's a very powerful practice for everyone to engage in because we all need to practice self-care. And at the heart of Qigong, it's, it's self-care. And the thing about Qigong that's incredibly valuable is that it's highly adaptable. You can modify it countless different ways so that it can meet you wherever you're at on your physical journey. Someone who is navigating the, the cancer journey, I'm sure has very, at times, very limited amounts of physical energy. So even just the simple act of breathing and breathing with awareness is an important part of Qigong. And there are movements in Qigong that you can do while seated in a chair or lying down there's so many different ways to access the, the medicine. So I can't recommend it and sing its praises enough because I've seen what it can do to help people from all walks of life, but particularly people who are basically trying to restore their energy reserves because cancer takes so much from you. We have to find a way to replenish and restore all that's lost and tap into our own inner inner power. And I'll finish with this. There are natural healing properties within the body. And Qigong and movement in general is a way to tap into those healing properties. 
there's all the treatments that one goes through for cancer. And I think Qigong is a wonderful and Chinese medicine is a wonderful complement to all of that. That's so true. I've heard a lot of people sing its praises as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important, the point that you made that anyone can do it, even if they have mobility issues. It sounds like to me, Stephen, that it really starts with a state of mind. Is that correct? That's a really good point. What I think is what you're getting at is just this connection between the mind and the body. Yes. You can't separate the two. Mm -hmm. They are all all connected. Uh, so it's important to to think about health in that way because how we think and and how we view our experience, I think impacts how we move through our journey yeah. and what we choose to focus on and what we choose to cultivate. That's very true because that mind body connection is very powerful. and I don't think a lot of people realize that your body really follows what your mind is thinking or feeling. So it's important to get those two things in alignment. And Qigong sounds like an excellent way to help someone do that. Absolutely. It's a practice that invites us to check in. There's so many things in life that are pulling at us from different directions. Just think about all the things that we encounter in a day that's always asking for our attention, whether it's the media, whether it's our children, our jobs, countless things. And all of those things takes a toll on us. So Qigong is a practice to help us turn within and notice how we're feeling in our physical body. Notice how we're feeling emotionally. Notice what our, our most occurring thoughts because oftentimes our thoughts are cyclical and, and we have countless thoughts in a day, but sometimes we tend to ruminate on certain thoughts. So Qigong is a practice that brings us into awareness of all those things. And we can't change anything in our lives if we're not aware of how we're feeling, what we're thinking, what our experience is. Unfortunately, society, in a sense, tells us to ignore how we're feeling or act as if nothing's wrong. When in reality, that is something that can make us sick as well, is holding in all those emotions, feelings, and traumas that can actually make us sick. So that's mm -hmm. one thing I really want people to understand that it's important to feel the feeling, to work through those emotions and not pretend like you're a hundred percent when in reality you're not. And I really love how you tie Chikong to checking in with yourself. That's so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And something that you just said reminded me of something else that from a traditional Chinese medicine standpoint, energy is supposed to flow freely through the body. And when it doesn't flow freely, whether that's because of tension, pain, emotional duress, illness, energy gets stuck, stagnant. And so that is where, from a Chinese medicine standpoint, disease tends to occur. And so Qigong is a practice of moving the energy through the body. Also moving that emotional energy that can get stuck. Emotional energy can get stuck in our tissues and oftentimes, you know, when we are like, how do we all deal with stress in the world, right? We tend to create more tension in the body. We tend to contract when we're feeling overwhelmed or stressed. Shoulders go towards the ears. Uh, the chest, uh, the shoulders pull forward. We we just pull, fold in on ourselves. That's a representation of the energy being stuck, stagnant. So movement helps us to open the body up, open the breath so energy can flow more freely through the body as it should, just like water flows down a river, right? Yeah, and Stephen, I can actually see, of course, I haven't known you for years, but I can actually see how calm you are and hear how calmly you speak. And I can see how Qigong has helped you in that sense, 
But how did it become a part of your life? And I would like to hear from you how it has helped you. Qigong became a part of my life when I was in Chinese medicine school. I decided I wanted to become a Chinese medicine doctor. So I uh, enrolled in a program only to realize a semester in that wasn't quite the right path for me. So I switched, turned my gaze onto something else and became a massage therapist instead and added it to my other existing skill set of being a Pilates instructor. But Qigong was part of the curriculum at the Chinese Medicine School in uh, San Jose, California. And it entered my life at exactly the right moment because that was an incredibly stressful time for me. Imagine moving across the country to go to school and do something that you were just so convinced that's what you were supposed to do, only to realize that, no, that's not where you should be. So you have to course correct. And after you've told everyone that this is what you're going to do and you were just so certain, it's very disconcerting. It was an incredibly stressful time in my life. And also, I'm someone who is in recovery have been for a very long time. And the stress of that period, I, I was uncertain whether or not I was going to be able to stay sober through that. And one of the things that helped me, in addition to my 12-step recovery, was Qigong. That moments before my Qigong class, I could be in my car crying because of the anxiety I was feeling around the course load and an and exam that was that night or what have you, but I go into that Qigong class, uh, the teacher would begin with a lecture. We'd eventually get up, go to the center of the room and, and start doing some physical practice. And all of that worry, all of that anxiety, all of that fear, all of that sadness that I was feeling and confusion started to just melt away. And week after week, I would experience this and it empowered me. It empowered me to get clarity on, on my life and my situation. When you're in the middle of some crisis, all you can focus on is that thing. But when you have a practice that can give you space and give you breath and allow you to zoom out and see the big picture, it's quite a different experience. So that's what Qigong gave for me. And it, and it showed me that it could enhance my life, enhance my recovery. And I knew that it was a practice that I could share with other people and that others would be able to benefit from not only my story, but also just from the practice of this medicine that you don't even have to know a lot about Qigong in order to benefit from it. All you have to do is show up and just do a practice, just follow instructions, and the medicine just does its work. It does what it does. And so that's how Qigong entered my life. And I, I knew that I was, from that moment on, was on a mission to share it with as many people as I possibly could. And I love it. I love what I do. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Stephen, what are some other modalities that you practice that can help cancer patients and then also help them to manage the side effects of the treatment? So I practice uh, Qigong, uh, mindfulness and meditation. Also, I think that's part of Qigong, but it's also something that can be quite separate just in terms of how we're able to practice presence and awareness and acceptance of what is, that's a very important part of my daily practice. Movement is always a, an important part of my life and part of my experience. And that's my mission to share that. But I think movement is something that's healing for everyone. So whether it's Pilates, I think Pilates is a wonderful practice for everyone. It's another one that's very highly adaptable that there's there's so many ways in which you can do it and it strengthens the body and it also helps to create more suppleness in the body and it can be used with anyone no matter what their ability level is when joseph pilates first created the method i believe back in the 1920s or so 
the first people that he worked with are people who were sick in internment camps and they were bedridden. He created a apparatus that he just took bed springs and put them on the wall behind the sick person's bed and just attached handles to the springs so the person can lie there and move their arms with spring resistance or move their legs with spring resistance so that they got some sort of movement in their body, even though they um, weren't able to get up and walk and exercise maybe the way that they had normally would. And people tended to fare better in terms of getting well. Joseph believed that breath was life and that most of us don't breathe properly. Most of us don't exhale all of the stale air out of our body. And when that stale air stays in the body, it leads to illness and dysfunctions in the body. So he was all about the breath and connecting movement with the breath, which is exactly what Qigong does as well. So those are practices that are central in my life. And I've worked with a lot of people dealing with serious health issues. And these types of movements have been really beneficial to them because it's able to meet them wherever they're at on their journey. Stephen, you mentioned breathing correctly. Number one, what is the correct way to breathe? And number two, what is something people, for example, someone is waiting to get a scan done and they're just really stressed, they're full of anxiety. Please share with us a quick breathing technique that people can do to get recentered and bring themselves back to a better place? Yes, that's a great question. We all breathe, right? We take countless numbers of breaths in a day and in a lifetime. But again, many of us don't breathe well. A breath that serves us best is one where the diaphragm, which is a muscle, it's a dome-shaped muscle in your torso, that's just below your lungs. And whenever you take a, an inhale, that muscle draws down into the body, which creates a vacuum that draws the air into the lungs. And then when that muscle relaxes, it floats up and it forces the air out of the lungs and out of your body. And there's a whole other host of muscles that contribute to this uh, process of respiration, but the diaphragm is the primary one so many of us don't get that movement of the diaphragm, don't get that expansion of the, the belly as we breathe in. Many of us keep our breaths in our chest, right? We just keep it all in the chest, which makes all the other muscles, the smaller muscles that are part of our process of respiration and breathing, but they're meant to just help out a little bit. <laughs> they're not meant to do the heavy lifting, but when we do this type of breath where it just stays in the chest, that's known as a stress breath, right? So when we're under stress, we tend to keep it all in the chest, in the neck, and that's where the shoulders tend to go up towards the ears and for a lot of people when we feel stressed. So learning how to breathe correctly where there is this movement of the diaphragm, where there is this expansion of the muscles between the rib cage, where there is that little lift of the chest, and yes, there's Part of the reason why the chest lifts is because there are neck muscles that are attached to the ribs that lift as well. When all those mechanisms of breath work in harmony, then we're able to breathe more deeply into the body more fully. And we're able to self-regulate. So when you talk about people in a situation where they're in a waiting room, waiting to receive care, feeling anxiety, maybe before they're going in to have a, a procedure done and they're feeling anxious, they're probably not breathing deeply. They're probably holding the breath in the chest. One of the things that one can do is just place the hands on their belly, like right one palm on top of the other on the center of your belly, and just take a nice deep breath in through your nose. And as you inhale, just feel your belly expand, not like a balloon expanding. And as you exhale out, you can do it through your nose or through your mouth, your belly will soften. So it's like that balloon loses its air. You can also envision it this way. As you inhale, your belly button moves away from your spine. And as you exhale, your belly button draws inward towards your spine. 
And as you breathe in, you can think about, say, breathing in for five counts. If you can breathe in for five counts, that's great. And if you can't do five counts, maybe do four counts. And then as you exhale, see if you can breathe out in the same number of counts. So allowing your breath to be slow, eventually working up to a point where maybe your inhale is shorter, but your exhale is much longer than your inhale. Just doing that, taking between five and 10 breaths is a way to regulate your nervous system when you're triggered and stress will trigger your nervous system and send you into fight or flight. So deep breathing helps us to self-regulate and just come to a point, a place of balance. And when we're able to come to that place of balance, you'll notice that we're calmer, but we can also think better, right? Maybe we're able to assess the situation more calmly and more rationally, step out of some of the fear we were feeling and just find a way to center ourselves and just know that we are more than capable of handling anything that comes our way today. So that's just a simple way to incorporate the breath and awareness of breath in your life. You reminded me of a time that I took my mother to the hospital. She was having back surgery. Mother's in her early 70s. Mm -hmm. She was very scared. She was really nervous. And I remember just sitting with her in the waiting room and just teaching her exactly that exercise. And she was amazed that she actually felt better afterwards. And it's that simple, like that level of healing is accessible to each and every one of us, as long as we have the ability to breathe, right? Thank you so much, Stephen, for taking the time to walk us through. I think it's just so important for people to have something quick that they can tap into and get recentered and feel better and more in control. It's empowering to people to know that no matter what situation I'm in, I can just take these quick seconds and take care of myself. So thank you. My pleasure. Stephen, I'd like to transition to talking more about your book. As I mentioned earlier, it's called Recovering You, Soul Care and Mindful Movement for Overcoming Addiction. Please share the main message of your book and what the readers can gain from reading your book. Mm. So the main message from the book, what I hope people walk away from when they read the book or listen to it, because it's also available on Audible, that they know that they're not alone in any challenges that they face. They're not alone. They are worthy of change, transformation, recovery. Hopefully they'll from listening to my story and the stories of other friends of mine that I interview as part of the book, that they'll be able to find themselves in the stories in, in some way and just know that what they're experiencing is absolutely okay. They're exactly where they're supposed to be and that there is hope. The book in and of itself is about self-care. Caring for yourself. Self-care is something that we all need, but most of us don't get enough of it. And people who are dealing with addiction tend to lack self-care on, on a different level. Taking care of the body, taking care of some of our other needs aren't always on the top of the list when you're dealing with addiction. It's about satisfying that, that hunger, that craving, that thing that distracts you from the realities of your life, right? Recovering You is a book about recovering parts of yourself that you lost as a, as a result of the addiction. And I'm not just talking about drugs and alcohol and cigarettes. I'm talking about food. I'm talking about cigarettes. I'm talking about gambling, sex, work, social media. There's so many things that we can depend upon that pull us away from ourselves and help us to cope with life. So it's a self-care manual for all of us dealing with addiction in all forms, but also for the people who love them too, because it's incredibly stressful caring for, loving someone, holding space for someone who is on a journey of addiction, trying to work their way to recovery. And those people need practices too, 
to help them because stress, like I said earlier, stress depletes us of our energy. It's one of the main ways that we lose our life force energy, our chi. So through the stories in the book that I share, little helpful tips that I share around how to deal with fear, shame, how to cultivate more social support in your life, how to challenge your perceptions. I think people with addictions and addiction as part of their story ha- tend to have a negative perception of themselves in life, how to turn that around. And then also how to connect to gratitude and how to develop faith and trust in yourself and also a power greater than yourself, whether that's nature or some other uh, thing that you may believe in, just so that you know that you're not alone and that you're not calling the shots in life, right? There's very few things in life that we have control over. All we have control over is ourselves. So how do we get back to ourselves? How do we nurture ourselves? How do we love ourselves? How do we accept ourselves? And how do we be our greatest cheerleader? So important. Be your greatest cheerleader. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where can they find your book? You can find my book on uh, Amazon. You can also find it at Barnes & Noble and other booksellers. You can also find it on Audible. I did the recording for the audiobook myself. So if you're enjoying the sound of my voice today, you can have more (laughs) of it. You can have more of it by getting my audio book. And you can also have, find links to that all on my website, stephenwashingtonexperience.com. You can find links to purchase the book in addition to all the other things that, that I offer, whether it's my membership community, SWE Studio, which I feel is a SWE Studio where I teach a Pilates and Qigong fusion class, amongst other things. It's a online wellness community that's designed to meet you wherever you're at on your fitness journey, on your wellness journey. And it's ultimately self-care. And like I said, we all need self-care and most of us don't get enough of it. So I'm all about giving people tools that they need to help themselves. You can also find all my social media uh, links as well. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, you name it. I'm there. TikTok, creating content that's free. And other things like my online courses are also on my site too. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I will put that information in the list and notes as well. As we wind down, Stephen, I do want people to know, just because it's one of my favorite things, that you were actually involved in Lion King. If you don't mind just sharing a little bit about that, I'm a huge fan. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> mm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I feel like singing a little bit of the song. <laughs> One of the songs, Ingo Nyama Nengue Namabala, Ingo Nyama Nengue Namabala. That's all, uh, that's part of the, the first song, Circle of Life. So yes. I started doing Lion King back in 2001, and I joined the Toronto cast of the show. I had auditioned for the show once out of 200 guys, made it down to the last five, didn't get the job. But they kept my name on file and they called me a year later and I went in for another audition. Thinking it was going to be a group audition and it was a solo audition. Just me and the casting director and the associate choreographer. Then I got the job and within a few weeks I was living in Toronto, Canada doing the show. I was a swing, which is a person who has to know all the different parts of different dancers. So I had five or six dancers that I understudied and I knew how to do all their parts, whether it was one day I would be walking on giraffe stilts, the next day I'd be a zebra, the next day I would be a wildebeest, you name it, I was everything. And then I eventually made my way to Broadway. Then I went on the touring, joined the touring company. I did the show from 2001 to about 2009. Wow. It's a really long time, really long time. It was a dream come true. It really was a dream come true. And Lion King is a family. Yeah. There, there's yeah. so many different companies of Lion King all around the world. And the people that you meet truly do become lifelong friends. And uh, and it's still one of the most magical pieces of theater on stage. And it's quite transformational. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Such a blessing. Wow. I read that and I'm like, wow, I have to ask him about that experience. <laughs> <laughs> 
before we end, Stephen, I want to ask two more questions just to get a little more personal and learn a little bit more about you. I like to ask my guests these questions. The first one is, what is something that people often misunderstand about you? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Oh, okay. First thing that comes to mind is I have a quiet, calm nature. And I think that sometimes people aren't able to fully embrace or understand my own humanity as if I'm as if they're living here and I'm living somewhere here because I seem to be pretty calm and serene but that does not make me perfect that does not make me any less human um doesn't mean that I make fewer mistakes uh, maybe how I navigate those mistakes and those lessons might be different but just like you, just like everybody else. Yeah. So that's what comes to mind. Thank you for sharing that. And finally, Stephen, what would you tell your 18 year old self? Oh boy. I would tell myself that you're enough. Yeah. I would say, Stephen, you're enough that just as you are, just as you are, stop running and racing to try to be something that you're not. Be yeah. yourself. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Yes. <laughs> sometimes we have to remind ourselves that every day, sometimes just because of the world we live in and the messages mm -hmm. that we constantly receive. Yeah. And comparison, yeah. how we compare oh. ourselves to other people. Yeah. 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 Oh, to be human. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stephen, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with me today for the wonderful and very helpful information that you've shared. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you would like to share? No, we've covered quite a bit mm -hmm. and it's been a wonderful ride. Thank you thank so much you. for facilitating this. Absolutely, Stephen. Thank you so much for bringing your calming presence and teaching us about some of the very helpful and healing modalities that you practice. I will definitely encourage people to go and visit your website to check out your YouTube channel and get more information. Oh, please do. Please do. And hopefully some of your listeners will sign up for my SWE studio. I'm offering a free 14 day trial. It's available to everyone. Go to my website, stephenwashingtonexperience.com for more information. Thank you, Stephen. Yes. Get that 14-day free trial and you get to hear his calming voice and calming presence for 14 days at least. So yes, please. Check it out. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. I would like to give a shout out to the listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. Please share, follow, or subscribe so that you can easily find my podcast and listen again. You can also find Navigating Cancer Together on Amazon Music. That is it for this Wednesday. And until next time, let's keep navigating cancer together. Take care. Lovely. Thanks for listening to this episode of Navigating Cancer Together. I hope you found it helpful. Please be sure to subscribe, share, and tell your friends and family about it. For notes from the show and previous episodes, visit ontheotherside.life and check out the podcast section. I would love it if you join me for the next episode. Talk to you soon.